Oh, thank you so much. It is truly an honor to be here. I am your neighbor. And please do not call me Dr. Butterfield. I have a PhD in English, which means I can only fix your metaphor. If you have a broken metaphor, you can, you can call me doctor. But if you don't have a broken metaphor, then I'm just your sister in the Lord, and you need to just call me Rosaria. I'm here with my husband, Kent, who's trying to sneak into a women's event in the back there, not be noticed, and my friend, Sarah. Um, and we'll be around later. I, I appreciate the questions coming through this device. I'm, um, if the Lord allows, we'll turn 60 later this year, so I'm just used to people asking me questions. So <laughs> if you wanna do it the old-fashioned way, we can get it done that way too. Um, when we talk about a watershed year or a time, we're, we're really referring to a time when before that day, you could say certain things and believe certain things and think certain things. And then after that day, those ideas were no longer allowed. And for some of us, for the young people in this room, the world we live in right now, it just, it, it's normal. It's how it's always been. You don't understand why people like me are, and your grandmothers and your mothers are like scratching their heads and needing a vocabulary sheet when you talk. And, um, and yet for, for older people, we can remember these watersheds. Uh, now, a watershed event, it's not that, you know, like, it's not like a bomb dropped. I mean, these are ideas, right? Ideas have a material force. They took hold and they shaped things. But there was something definitive about this one year in particular. And the year I want to talk about today is 2015. I'm going to talk really briefly. I have a term sheet on, the, on, the, uh, on your table in part so that I don't have to spend too much time uh, because this isn't necessarily easy listening to, but um, 2015 was a watershed year because it was the year when our culture lost all tolerance for Christianity. It was the year when fanatical self-delusion became trustworthy and biblical revelation suspicious. 2015 was the year that the Obergefell versus Hodges decision was, um, was upheld by the Supreme Court legalizing gay marriage in all 50 states. Now you might say, wow, Rosaria, why are you such you know, a rabid, nasty person? Why can't, I mean, what's wrong with gay marriage? Why can't we just expand the definition of marriage? How does, how does gay marriage affect your marriage? And that's a a question we might want to get to later, but the, there's a particular way that the Obergefell decision was, was argued, and that's why the grandmothers and the mothers are having a hard time talking to the young people. It's because of a, uh, something that was inserted into this uh, Supreme Court case called a dignitary harm clause. And what this meant was that to deny um, people who identify as gay the right to marry or the right to use whatever pronouns they want or the right to be affirmed in their homosexuality could only be done because of what legal uh, scholars would call animus, because of hatred. There'd be no other reason, no other reason on the planet and to deny a person's dignity is now a form of harm. Now you all know I lived as a lesbian for 10 years and it was back in the ancient days when the dinosaurs walked the earth and we thought that it was a harm if you didn't, you know, if I was trying to buy a pizza and you wouldn't sell me a pizza because I'm a lesbian, I want my pizza and I didn't get my pizza. But now harm means something else, harm is an attack on your self-claimed, self-identified dignity. And, um, and with that was this idea that there'd be no other reason on the planet, like say the Bible or the, the integrity of the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of the resurrection, the holiness of God, no other reason on the planet why anybody would have anything to say about homosexuality other than it's awesome, it's great, we love you, do whatever you want. And so, so I just wanna start there 
because I know many of you, I looked at some of the questions and I know many of you are trying to f understand why, why is it no longer okay if I can, why can't I just accept you? Why do I have to approve of you also? And why is my love somehow resting on my approval? I mean, if that's really true, if love rests on approval, then it, it means that no parent ever loved a child ever. I mean, in the history of people having children and parenting them, right? So I just want to get that out of the way before we jump in, just so that you know, it really did change. If you wonder, like, if it feels like it's a different world, you're walking on eggshells, you can't, you know, sharing the gospel is considered, um, you know, a, 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 an act of violence against a person's identity. Well. It was right there in the Supreme Court decision in 2015, and, and I, I argue, I won't go into that right now, but I argue that that was a very, um, that that was the moment when the gospel and sexual orientation as a category of personhood started on a collision course. Um, because God has a different definition of who you are as a person. It's found in Genesis 127, and God says, that every human being on the planet has dignity because you are made in the image of God. Everyone wants dignity and everyone has dignity, not because of your sexual desires, but because of your majestic and purposeful design. And so there's a lot at stake in the church nodding and smiling with the world. Uh, there's a lot at stake, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big problem. I mean, it's a terrible thing to lose your children to the world. It's, it's worse to lose your children to a church that's gone apostate. So, since the publication of my conversion memoir in 2012, before that watershed date, I have found myself squarely at the center of so many of the debates in this world. Um, and I, I have them on your term sheet, the Obergefell decision, um, wokeness in the church, intersectionality as a way of accruing dignity to a person. We can talk about those later if you, if you want, if you're interested. Um, conversion to Christ did not initially change my sexual attraction for women. What conversion did change immediately was my heart and my mind. And through the means of God's grace and the kind company of faithful Christian women, I learned to repent of sin in a holistic way. I began to see that my sexual desires for women were not a reflection of who I was, which is what I would have told you, back in my lesbian professor days, but, but rather it was a sin. It was a distortion of who God would have me to be. I had to face it squarely that my lesbianism, while it felt very normal and natural, was a sin. And one quotation from John Owen, the great Puritan, really stood out to me during these years. The, the Puritan John Owen said, you cannot mortify a specific lust that is troubling you unless you are seeking to obey the Lord from the heart in all areas. And I realized that through John Owen, Christ bled as much for the sin of my pride and lying as he did my sexual lust. And I learned that I couldn't excuse my lesbianism on any ground at all. That, I learned that it all just had to go that if I was a Christian, God had already given me the power to battle my sin. And soon, union with Christ became an emerging component to my identity, one that actually competed with my sexual identity. And that's when I noticed it. Sexual attraction to anyone or anything forbidden by God is degrading. It degrades a human being. It's not dignity, it's the opposite of dignity. Psalm 73, 22 expressed what it was like for me to wake up to my sexual sin. And let me say, I woke up to my sexual sin at the same time that I was attracted to it. It's not like waking up to your sin doesn't mean that you're lobotomized, it just didn't happen that way. But this is what 70, uh, Psalm 73, 22 said. I was senseless and ignorant. 
I was like a beast before you. A beast. I was a beast. Now this was 1999 before anyone in the church had lost their way sufficiently to believe that I was a sexual minority, that I needed a revoiced gospel, that maybe I just needed to embrace my identity as a gay Christian. No, my church was not confused and I praise God for that, even though I was. My church loved me too much to utter foolish heresy. This was also before, obviously, 2015, before LGBTQ held civil right weight, and before anyone believed that calling me to repent of my sin was an attack on my dignity. Like a number of other people who had lived in the gay community prior to these days, I look back on it now and I am so thankful that the Lord knew that I was such a weak woman, I needed to be converted you know, 25 years ago and not today, because it would be so much harder today, so much harder. A weak, apostate, confused church, a world that calls sin grace and grace sin. Do you know how people feel? They feel like they're being torn apart by wild horses. That's how they feel, it's not pleasant. Um, but, that's the, the challenge, right, that the Christian has today. Um, what I'm saying today might be very well illegal to say tomorrow. I'll say it anyway, but you know, just so you know. There's no dignity in sin. Um, what my church offered me was real hospitality, not counterfeit hospitality, and real friendship. They showed me how to lean hard and heavy on the word of God. They did not ask me to teach them how to give people like me greater visibility in the church. They modeled for me how our troubles and conflicts became opportunities for the Christian to experience the ways of the Lord in his strength. Now at this time, I was a completely double-minded Christian. You know that person James talked about, that was me. I used to actually have nightmares that the elders of my church would be in the back of my Women's Studies 101 class. I mean, I was a professor, I was right in the middle of a semester, um, you know, with placards that would say things like, you're a heretic, you know, <laughs> they never did that. Um, but I did live in two worlds. I was a tenured English professor of English and queer theory at Syracuse University, and there I was surrounded by lesbian couples, other professors and professional colleagues and neighbors, and they had decade-long monogamous gay relationships. And furthermore, these were dear old friends. We had shared vacations together and, uh, you know, tenure woes together and, and life and we called ourselves family. And I knew them and their households and their children well, and I loved them and I couldn't imagine life without them. And the thought that they would have to break up with each other and confess their sin to have Christ's forgiveness and saving grace, quite frankly, seemed unfair to me. They would have to lose everything. Now, mind you, I had just lost everything, but I, I, I don't know, I felt like somehow it wasn't quite as bad for me as it was for them. Their houses were safer, their houses were more stable. And quite frankly, when I looked at some of these lesbian households, I just thought, well, maybe it just proves that some people are better off left to what the Bible calls sin. Well, I knew that it was a sin to think this way um, um, and to be so double-minded, and I cried out to God to help me understand how this could be. I mean, how I could see my own sin, both the sin of my sexuality and the sin of my identity, as something that degraded me and made me a beast, and yet at the same time see others in the lesbian community and their happy and stable households in a completely different way. I mean, I am such a good postmodernist. I could manage all of this and do cartwheels. And, you know, so I just prayed. And I prayed this. This is a prayer I pray a lot. Lord, help me to come face to face with your word on this problem. Um, that was something Floy Smith, the pastor's wife that discipled me, taught me to pray. I'm like, okay, it works for Floy. Maybe it's going to work for me. Let me pray that prayer. But, it, but it's, a, it's a focusing prayer. It's a prayer that forces you not just to read the Bible, but to study it, which can be very, very helpful. Well, this prayer brought me to the Gospels and to the disciples 
and the holy love that they had for the Lord Jesus Christ and for each other. And while the narrative of scripture doesn't tell us what they lost all the time or what they left, you know they lost something. You know they left something. Nobody comes to Jesus without doing that. And so it seemed to me that this was real love. This is what real love, real love doesn't cause others to sin. This love so cherished its beloved that you would sacrifice all unholy desires that could separate you, the person you loved, from the God who made her. And I started to understand that my lesbian friends could actually have this kind of love too. That they could actually love each other more and better if they were not sinning against each other. That they actually could have greater intimacy if they broke up and came to Christ. And this was very startling for me and this made me call out to God to make me a godly woman. And then the strangest thing happened in the midst of this prayer, and I talk a little bit about it in Secret Thoughts. It was a really crazy prayer at night. At, at that moment, the Lord also put upon my desire to pray that the Lord would make me a godly wife of a godly man. And after I prayed that, I laughed out loud, and I thought, well, where in, where in the world did this come, where did this come from? It was obviously too much you know, cayenne pepper in the Thai food I was eating that night, right? Um, so, so I say all of this to you because I want you to know that homosexuality is absolutely part of my biography. Uh, there's almost no way to get around that. And I'll bet there are a lot of some, there's some choice sins that are part of your biography too. But when a sin is part of our biography, that does not mean that that sin is our nature. There's a difference between biography and nature. Um, my nature is made new in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Conversion comes in exchange of the life you lived, not in addition to it. And this is reflected in both our actions and our words. So while homosexuality will always be part of my biography, sin is in any form never any part of the nature of a true Christian. So of course I'm not a gay Christian because nobody is. Neither am I in a mixed orientation marriage because that doesn't exist. It's unthinkable, it's biblically impossible. Now, sin makes more work for us, and along with more work, sin makes more words for us. This doesn't believe that Christians have to believe them. So the gospel calls for change. There is no way to be a Christian and not be changed. God does not love you just the way you are and leave you there. It's just not, not the God of the Bible. It, that's impossible. So what does that change look like? That's been a very vexed question. Well, first of all, there's no place in scripture where we see that God loves and bestows upon you the blessings of saving faith without rigorous change to and within the person who is justified by God. We live in a world, uh, we live in a world that's called a self-ID world. How do I know I'm a man trapped in a woman's body? Well, because I told you so, that's why. How do I know my pronouns are it and dragon? Well, I told you so, that's why. How do I know I'm a Christian? Well, I told you so, that's why, except for that that's not gonna work. A Christian is not someone who loves a fictional Jesus the Jesus that you make up by cutting out parts of the Bible and creating a paper mache doll. You're not saved by that. You may be deluded by that, but you're not saved by that. A Christian is fundamentally not first and foremost someone who loves Jesus. A Christian is first and foremost someone who is loved by Jesus. Well, 
This is a very contested issue. Advocates of gay Christianity, A and B, and by the time I finish this lecture, that'll probably be C, D, E, F, and G, um, say that it's actually the church that has to change. The church needs a revoice. The church needs to um, understand how hateful and harmful it's been. The church needs to repent of, of its sin. The church does need to repent of sin. Everybody needs to repent of sin all the time. And that's not a shameful thing to do at all. Repentance of sin is the threshold to a holy God. Christians love the, 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 the glory and the holiness that repentance gives to a holy God. But Christians are not called to repent of made up sins. If, you know, sometimes being called to repent of sin is a real shocker. It, it offends our sense of what we like. That's true for everybody. There's not a special gospel for people who call themselves LGBTQ. And the reason there's not a special gospel for that is that that's actually not a category of personhood. And I'll get to it later in my lecture, but LGBTQ refers not to who somebody is, but to how somebody feels. There's two different things. So we are called to repent of unchosen and ask, unasked for sinful desires. Colossians 3.5 calls the believer to change not just outward behavior, but the evil desires that fuel it. The Bible teaches, and the 16th century Christian writer Sarah Hawks records that sin, quote, insinuates itself into our motives, designs, objects, thoughts, prayers, and every action, sleeping and waking. Genesis 6, 5, Mark 7, 20 to 23, bring to light that the fall of man and the original sin that it bequeathed drives corruption deep into the cavernous desires of our hearts. And Ephesians 4, 22 to 24 calls for the transformation of our inner being to conform to Christ's righteousness. And at the same time, the Bible compassionately reveals that all true Christians are at war. There's an inner war going on. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Galatians 5.16. But sin no longer defines us. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Paul reminds us in Romans 6.11, our call is not to despair, but to hope in Christ and to drive a fresh nail into our choice sin every day or maybe every hour. Because of what Christ did on the cross, the Christian is no longer in bondage to sin although sin still knows your name and your address. And while sin is no longer in your nature, Christ has covered you in a robe of righteousness, taken that sin upon himself. That sin still very likely resides in your patterns of thought and word and deed and must be daily battled with. But we do more than battle. All right, that's called the mortification of sin. We do more than mortify sin. We have to grow alive to something all, what the, what the King James would call vivify. We have to be quickened. We have to be alive. And that comes through the central privilege of the Christian faith, uh, the one that keeps us in God's will even when it hurts, and that is called union with Christ. The central privilege of the Christian faith is not attending conferences where you seek visibility in the church for you, your unique problems and peeves. No, it's union with Christ, which means that we have died and risen with Christ. It is the single most extraordinary privilege 
a believer has. Ever wonder how in the world John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress? 12 years in prison? You know, it wasn't because he had fun conferences to go to. Not even close. Union with Christ explains how Christ both redeems your future and heals your past. At the moment that your heart is regenerated and you are born again, the Holy Spirit forges a spiritual, unbreakable, irreplaceable, and eternal union between the sinner and Christ. This union is better than the one Adam had in the garden when he walked and talked openly with God prior to the fall. I mean, Adam's union, after all, depended on his obedience. How'd that go? But our union depended on, depends on Christ's obedience. That's a lot more secure. When we say that all believers are united to Christ by faith, union with Christ is what we're talking about. All believers have union with Christ, but if you do not exercise it, build it up, make it strong, depend upon it, study it, cultivate it, this precious doctrine may remain dormant. You might not even know what I'm talking about. That doesn't mean you're not a believer. It means that there are some faith muscles that need to be strengthened. That's why we're here, to strengthen each other in faith. When union with Christ is not enjoyed, exercised, practiced, cultivated, the cares of the world sneak up and they steal our joy and they weaken our faith. If union with Christ, though, means that we have died and risen with our Lord, why have we died? You know, why did, why did we have to go through that? Why did he have to go through that? Well, because of sin. And why have we risen? Well, because of the merits of Christ's blood shed on the cross for me and you and everyone who believes. And in that blood, we are given a supernatural power to no longer be in bondage to sin. Now, that doesn't mean we don't know where it exists. We do, that doesn't mean we don't are tempted by it. But we don't have to obey it. That's what your liberty is. Your liberty is to disobey Satan and sin and to obey God joyfully. So we have union with Christ in three ways. Imminent union, redemptive historical union, and applicatory union. And if you're wondering where I get, I'm getting these, um, uh, this is uh, part of the way the Puritans understood the theology of union with Christ. And so I'm working with a uh, book by Mark Jones and uh, Mark Beek, uh, Joel Beakey uh, called A Puritan Theology. So the first is imminent union, and it's Ephesians 1.4. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Right there, right there, the amazing privilege of God's electing love. I don't care how bad your day is. That is cosmically amazing. So, imminent union. Two, redemptive historical union. And that's in Romans 6, 3 through 11. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he shall live to God. So you also must consider yourselves 
dead to sin, and alive to God in Christ Jesus. When um, in the book of Hebrews, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, come boldly to the throne of grace, that's what this means. And this is really important. I mean, let me just be very, very bold. After something like 10 hours of whatever your choice in is, when you feel like you can't possibly be a Christian because how could you have done that? That's of course what Satan would like you to think. This is the verse and this is the application of the union with Christ that you use to take with you to the throne of grace because the Lord has sympathy. Not empathy, but sympathy and compassion. What Satan wants you to say to yourself is if you're truly a Christian, you can't possibly sin in this way. What the Lord wants you to say to yourself is come to the throne of grace and get what you need and be strengthened. Repent of your sin and seek forgiveness. And then finally, we have applicatory union with Christ. That might be the one that you're more familiar with. It's, it's when through, you're reading the scriptures and the Holy Spirit really presses something upon your heart and you're like, ah, yes, exactly, you do hear me. Um, and that's found in Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. There are many here today who are praying for a loved one who's been lost to the LGBTQ madness. And God's message to you as a believer is that you are to stay connected, but don't get indoctrinated. And it is union with Christ that allows you to do that. It is union with Christ that promises you that he will show you the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness. And we will all be praying that that will happen in the land of the living. Union with Christ is the dynamic and supernatural power that God gives his redeemed people. And this union is made manifest in these three interdependent ways. But, and here's the but, you simply cannot have union with Christ if you have made an identity out of anything else, including your sexuality or your gender. Union with Christ demands that Christ has exclusive claims on his redeemed people. Indeed, you do yourself great harm if you insist on holding two forms of self-representation, sexual and spiritual, as reflected in the category of gay Christian, because both forms of self-representation compete for the very same thing. Your loyalty, your heart, your sense of self, your faith. Sexual identity is simply incompatible with union with Christ. Indeed, you simply cannot have your identity in your sexual orientation or your gender identity and Christ because there is no dual citizenship for a Christ follower. A Christ follower has a single mission and she does not bow down to the idol of sexual orientation and gender identity. And the simple reason is that God has a very clear message to us about what to do with idols. And it's not add them to the mantelpiece. That's not what he says to do with idols. Idols must be publicly repented of. Like Nehemiah, we must take ownership of our nation's sins and publicly repent of them. We must stand in our union with Christ and against the idea that sexual identity encompasses personhood. We must not fear truth and we must not fear being ambassadors of God's truth. Personal identity is not in the eyes of the beholder. It is in God's hands, and that's the very best news of all. All believers have to learn how to hate your sin without hating yourself. That's not just for people who experience same-sex attraction or any of the other uh, sin categories that are organized under LGBTQ. Every believer needs to learn how to hate your sin without hating yourself. It is our union with Christ 
that allows us to do this. But how in the world did we get to this place where sexual orientation is believed to explain not just how a person feels, but actually who a person is? I mean, how did we get to this place where Justice Kennedy says that you're harming someone's dignity by not affirming a non-biblical anthropology? I mean, how did we get to a place when a child who is in a, engaged in such an extreme case of self-harm that that minor wants to genitally mutilate himself and therapists say to parents, you know, well, did you go to the gay pride parade? You know, because obviously your child needs stickers in a parade. I mean, I am convinced that if the Lord should tarry, we are going to look no better than the days of Moloch. How did people sacrifice their children to Moloch? Well, how do people think that their children who want to self-mutilate need stickers in a parade? It's delusional. And the church, some aspects of the church, are participating in the delusion. Well, it's interesting to know where this delusion first started. Those of us who are historians are like, okay, this was a really crazy bad idea, but who started it first? Sigmund Freud. I want you to know, I was talking to the dear Martha Peace on the phone yesterday, and we were talking a little bit about some of these ideas, and she said, you know, Rosaria, every time you talk about Freud, it makes me uncomfortable. Back when, you know, back in my day, if the men were talking about Freud and a woman walked into a room, the men stopped talking. It was like a curse word. Um, but it is indeed Freud, the psychoanalyst, um, who gave us the category of sexual orientation. It's part of his psychoanalytic paradigm. Now, it's, it's not a small thing that uh, Freud believed that uh, anyone who believed in God was engaging in a cultural phobia. And it's also significant to know the 19th century had its own watershed moment when you had Freud and Darwin, right, who believed that Christianity was a coping mechanism, and, and Marx, who famously declared that religion was the opiate of the masses. And all three of them together created their own watershed moment. Um, but it was also at this time, thanks to Freud, that we witnessed a change in what it meant to be human. Prior to the 19th century, all people, regardless of faith tradition, were just universally understood to have a biological sex that mattered, male or female. And logic and nature was enough to prove this. And this biological sex had not only a form, but a telos, which is a, philosophical, a, a philosophical concept of endpoint. There was a purpose to your design. But Freud's studies on human sexuality, combined with the rise of birth control and other things that were very popular in the 19th century, modernized what it meant to be human. And the old ways seemed very insensitive to these new feelings. And by the 20th century, people were defined as sexual beings. Have you ever heard that? People are sexual beings. Well, that's a Freudian idea, whose different objects of desire determine separate categories of identity. So this shift from seeing people as distinctly male and female bearers of a holy God, image bearers of a holy God with eternal purposes, that's biblical anthropology, to sexual beings whose human flourishing depended on engaging in the sexual activity of their own choosing and desire resulted in the world we have right now where sexual orientation is seen as a true reflection of personhood who you are, right? You'd say, I am gay. You'd use that, you'd use that copula, that, that linking verb, who you are, not how you feel. So then your sexual orient, orientation is not out there, right? Which is where you can deal with things. But it's in here, which is where you can't. What the category of sexual orientation as a category of person does is it, 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 it completely kicks out, by a lot, uh, sorry, kicks out uh, scriptural or biblical anthropology and instead embraces 
something else entirely. And it is probably the best example of what it looks like when the potter and the clay change places. So in turn, the category of sexual orientation has invited other categories of personhood to claim autonomy from objective categories of truth. Um, what is true for sexual orientation, says the culture, is likewise true for all identities of personhood that spring from deeply held subjective personal experience, perception, or feeling. And so you can have a day like our own day where uh, psychologists are engaging in a new category of sexual orientation, and that is, um, 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 what is it, minor, minor, uh, minor sex, sexual attraction to minors, right? Because it's just a sexual attraction. Maybe we should have a revoice for them. They promise to be really good and they probably, probably won't even be in the nursery too often, right? You buy that? That's crazy. Um, but it's also where you could have a situation where at the University of Pennsylvania, which is one of my alma maters, you could have a biologically male swimmer who has swum the last three years on the men's team now call himself a, a woman and swim on the women's team, and I know you're gonna be shocked, so don't fall off your chairs, but he's, he's winning. It helps not to have breasts if you're a swimmer, by the way, you know. He's winning, he's winning by things like 38 seconds. Do you know how long that is in swimming? That's enough time to get out of the pool and get a cup of coffee and come back. And, and nobody wants to say the truth except for some people actually are. And, and the issue is that in a sport like swimming, you're not competing identity against body, you're competing body against body. Bodies matter. The man-made category of sexual orientation created a shift, not only in what it means to be human, but also in what sexuality means. Self-representation and identity are now rooted in sexual orientation, not in the purpose of God for his image bearers. Now, it's really interesting because you might think that that was always something that the gay community thought would be a good idea, right? Be like, okay, get, you know, here's my place at the table. No. Um, French historian Michel Foucault, famous gay man who died of AIDS in 1980, uh, looked at Freud and this is what he said. He said, for the first time in the history of ideas in the 19th century, homosexuality appeared as one of the forms of personhood when it was transposed from the practice of sodomy, this is a gay man talking, right? Into a kind of interior androgyny, a hermaphroditism of the soul, if you will. The sodomite, had been a temporary aberration. The homosexual is a new species, Foucault wrote in the History of Sexuality, Volume 1. Now let's unpack what Foucault is saying here. He's saying, one, there have always been people who are sexually attracted to their own sex. Christians knew that. That's, that's in the garden. That's sin. You know, at the moment that Adam fell, sin entered the world, original sin. Uh, that's truly what we would call garden variety sin of the garden. Homosexuality was not created in the 19th century, and I'm not suggesting it was. But what Foucault is saying, and rightly so, is that in the 19th century, homosexuality was now understood not merely as a sexual practice, or as Christians would understand it, a sinful practice, but rather as a personal identity, one that encompassed sexual desire and sexual practice, but not merely limited to it. This was powerfully captured by the gay journalist Jonathan Rausch when he declared, this, he, he tweeted this out right after the Obergefell decision in 2015. He said, after Obergefell, the gay soul was born. His name is not eunuch or homosexual. His name is husband. Rausch reveals something important, something that God himself prepared us to understand. All people are valuable. All people matter. All people are born with an inherent dignity. And to God, our integrity is located in our image bearing of God himself. We are made in the image of God, not as the image of God. And in the image of God, when we are redeemed by Christ, we grow to be like Christ. 
in knowledge and righteousness and holiness, and our dignity is secure. Now, what we are dealing with today is a clear example of idolatry. Sexual orientation is so important that you can't even get a flu shot, apparently, without picking up a sticker at the front desk and letting the nurse know what pronouns you use, which makes some of us very worried if that nurse can't tell what pronouns I use, how she knows what she's putting in my arm, but that's another conversation. And the last thing I wanted to talk about was vaccines today. Can you imagine? Um, but, but I'm serious, right? I mean, it, it's an idol if you don't call your transgender nephew, you know, Marie, when you've called him, you know, Jason for 22 years, you're, you don't love him anymore. Well, that's absurd. And so, it, but it is an idolatrous moment. We are being asked to bow to the idol. We're being asked to kiss the idol. We're being asked to pet the idol and play some food scraps. And so, and it's really hard because there are people you love who are doing that and you don't want to lose them. And I don't want you to lose them either. Um, so I wanna end with just some things that I think we should do with idols. Number one, we need to love your neighbor enough to tell the truth. And sometimes that means you need to have a lot of time with your neighbor or your nephew or your daughter or whoever. There's a difference between acceptance and approval. I understand the Obergefell decision doesn't want me to say that, but it's true. And anyone here who's raised children knows it's true. Number two, you need to destroy the idol of sexual orientation. People are not defined by their sexual feelings. People are not defined by their sexual sins. This is not dignity, it's degrading. And number three, you need to know your enemy and don't call a wolf in sheep's clothing to disciple you or be your pastor or lead a conference in your church. Many of you are worried, very worried about what happens when the world has taken over the hearts of your children. Be more worried about what happens when the apostate church does. So I'll do number two because that's the one that really hits hard with our family members. If your daughter comes home from college and declares that she is a lesbian, you have the responsibility to listen well and love her sacrificially. But you need to know in your heart that your daughter is actually not a lesbian because no such category of personhood exists. Your daughter actually is an image bearer of a holy God, struggling and perhaps failing under the weight of a not yet talked about indwelling sin pattern. Perhaps she is a prayed for child in the covenant. And as you are listening to your daughter talk, and if she is a prayed for daughter, you need to be reminding Satan of that. Do you know what I'm saying about that? We're talking about prayed for children. That's a different category altogether. You need to know that her feelings are overwhelming her, that um, the world that we live in has assigned to her a role that God has not. And you need to know that she's struggling with feelings that are overwhelming her and that she's making a false peace with those. And in order to help your daughter, which you must do, you love her after all, you must stand apart from this idol that has captured her heart and our nation. You must remember who she really is and you need to remember who you really are. There is a world of difference between saying that your daughter struggles against the sin of homosexual desire and saying that your daughter is a lesbian. And Christian parents do not think that this idol is stronger than God. You must know who your daughter is before a holy God and who you are before a holy God and you need to shake the gates of heaven for her. You know, you might feel like an accidental missionary. You didn't, this wasn't the mission field you wanted. And all the other missionaries you know are taught the language and given the right shots, and you've landed on this mission field without even a bottle of water. And that's miserable. And that's why you're here, and that's why you're the Lord's, and that's why you're in the church. God has assigned you this high calling. So get what you need, but don't, don't bow to the idol. 
because that won't help. Another child sacrificed to Moloch does not help. So I'm just gonna say it boldly. I don't happen to think there's any such thing as a gay person. I don't happen to think there's any such thing as a trans person. Personhood belongs to God. Every human being is an image bearer of a holy God. Now, I don't know what the rest of you do during the day, but I'm a homeschool mom, and ver at various times throughout the week, I will field frantic phone calls from other homeschool mothers who have just lost their mind. <laughs> I know it's shocking. Um, they've screamed at their children again, they've neglected their husband, they've, they've failed again. And they are so mad at themselves and so discouraged. And this has happened, well, it happens every week. It happens three times a week. Sometimes it happens seven times a week. But I've never heard one of them say, this is who I am. I've always heard them say, pray again for me. I'm at that bad place. Do you know how much easier it would be for people who struggle against same-sex attraction and gender-related uh, confusion if they had the privilege to say, this is a bear, but that's out there. It's not me. And I can fight it. And yet we live in a world that says, no, 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 you gotta come out. Everybody's gotta come out. Everybody's an exhibitionist, have you noticed? Even your lunch is an exhibitionist. You can't even eat your lunch without putting it on some social media. It's absurd. <laughs> It's absurd. I mean, I actually had one pa pastor who calls him, you know, well, I, want, I don't want to get into it, but I'll, I'll tell you what he said to me. And you might, he said it publicly, so you might have heard it. He said that whenever I talk about union with Christ, I'm just trying to put him back in the closet. And you know, to, to, he actually called it a platitude. He said union with Christ is just, it's one of those platitudes that Rosaria likes to talk about. No, it's the central doctrine that separates a believer from an unbeliever. Thank you, Pastor Wolf. Um, that's, Wolf is not his last name. It's, it's just how he smells. Um, so, but I, th I think this is really serious because the question now remains, let's say you are struggling with same-sex attraction. How many people should you tell? Well, the world you, you, you live in says, here's the parade, here are the stickers, tell the whole world. And meanwhile, Satan's saying, thank you, another one. I'm so happy about that. No, whatever your indwelling sin pattern is, I don't care who it is, you need to tell the people who will protect you. Okay, no, you're not supposed to suffer alone. You really aren't. You need people to pray for you. So yes, I'm gonna say your pastor needs to know, your elders need to know, and a couple of really good close friends need to know because you need to call them in that primal scream way in the middle of the week, like my homeschool mom friends call me and I call them, right? But no, no, the world doesn't need to know. It's actually not safe for the world to know. So, how many people, have, I, I don't even know how many people I've offended. I'm gonna stop there, I could go on. But I know you have questions. But I want you to know that even though this might seem really overwhelming, here's what I do know. God designed that we would all be his ambassadors during this confusing time, right? You know, you didn't pick this time. I didn't pick this time. You didn't pick this problem. I didn't pick this problem. But God did. And in God's providence and his sovereignty, he also has equipped you. It's in the word of God, which is inerrant and sufficient and powerful and I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but do you know where the Apostle Paul was when he was writing to Timothy and telling Timothy that the word of God is sufficient? Do you know where the Apostle Paul was? He was on death row. He was on death row in a Roman prison. And you know, if, if I'm on death row in prison, that could happen. Um, and I think about what I would want to say to my children. 
Those would be really important words, wouldn't they? Like they would not be, they would not be small words. You know, your last words, last things are lasting things. I had a grandmother who would say, those are very powerful. So I, I would just wanna leave us with, with, with the book of 2 Timothy to ponder the fact that Paul was willing to say the most important thing for you to remember is the sufficiency of the word of God. Let's read that and then I'll open for questions. This is 2 Timothy 3, 10, 4 to 5. And you know, of course, I didn't have it marked, right? Isn't that always how it is when you're about to speak? Like, I don't know, I didn't have it marked. Does anybody have it before I do? So I'm paging around here. Anybody have it? Yeah, yeah. Can you, is there, is there a live mic? Yeah. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 10 to 4, 10, 4 to 5. Yeah. And then I'm going to grab it too. Let me, yes, let me, yes. Three, and then we're going to go, I'm sorry, it was 310 to chapter 4 to 5. But yes, um, I actually did finally find it. Um, so it, I'm gonna, it, it is, it's kind of a long section, so I'm not going to have you do this. So it's 310 to 4, 5, and I want you to hear this. But now that you all found it in your Bibles, read it along with me. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You too, mom, you too, grandma, you too faithful daughter, it's true. While evil people and imposters go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned. Continue in what you have learned. If there's some innovation, don't trust it. Test it, be a Berean. Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believe, knowing that from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but will have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Let's pray and then let's go to questions. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we thank you for this word and we thank you that we can trust it more than we do our own feelings. I pray for every woman here, Lord, that you would speak to her heart through this word and encourage her and embolden her. And Lord, each of us has the name of someone we love on our lips, and we need your help, Lord. And so we pray for our loved ones who are seduced by the LGBTQ um, paradigm of personhood, Lord. We pray that you would, that you would protect them we pray that you would remove all harmful influences from them. 
And we pray, Lord, that you would surround them with loving Christians who can indeed share the gospel of grace. And we pray that you, Lord Jesus, would be their identity. And we pray all of this in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, ladies, so we're gonna have um, some question and answer time with Rosaria. So like I mentioned, there's the Slido app on your phone. If you haven't had a chance, you can log on. The hashtag is hashtag teach me. And you can see the questions that have already been submitted. You can vote for the ones that you would like her to answer. Um, or if you have your own, you can submit that there as well. All right, so we're gonna get started. Give everybody a chance to log on here. All right, so our first question says, when the world is telling our children that their gender is their choice, how and when do we have gospel-centered conversations with them? Yeah, that's really important. And I think, you know, first of all, and like I said, I'm, I'm not, I sort of like my pagans straight up. You know, I just do. Like, I, I drink my coffee black and dark, right? So I, I don't mind uh, if the world, the world could say anything it wants. Um, uh, but I think it's when the church waffles that we have a real problem. Uh, because that's where people get real unsteady about, well, what does the Bible say? So um, Genesis 1, 27, 28 is the creation mandate. It says there that um, you are born, every human being on the planet is born male and female in the image of God. And this is where I think it's very helpful to, to not only understand the image of God, to not only read the Bible, but to study it. Um, and, and, and that's true for everybody. And I'd say it's especially true for our young people. We need to stop giving young people fluff, right? Here, let me tell you what, they don't need the faith of their fathers. They're gonna need a faith that exceeds the faith of their fathers especially with the way things are going now, right? So we need to, we need to get this. But, but the other thing that you need to realize is that the creation mandate is not peripheral to the gospel, it's central to it. Um, and so I would say, study that, understand that. And you know, just like with anything else, you would wanna help your child know what the Bible says, and not only know what the Bible says, but what the Bible is. You know, because I know when I first met Ken Smith and he's talking to me, I'm like, oh, it's really nice. You've got one book that says that and I've got 50 behind me that say you're a crackpot, you know? So, so you know, it, the fact that there's, you, the book says it, especially for a child who's maybe in, um, a, you know, a, a public university setting, that child, you know, that adult needs to know what the Bible is, um, why we believe in inerrancy. You know, what, what it is, what is the nature and the construction and the meaning of the Bible. And again, you know, my, my uh, you know, watchword is study it, don't just read it. Yes, excellent. How can you as a Christian lovingly converse with someone who wants you to use a specific pronoun? Oh, isn't that a tough one? And I would, you know, and I don't know... Um, Okay, let me just say, if you're a counselor and you're dealing with somebody who is um, unstable in some other areas and you're concerned about self-harm, and I'd say within the privacy of your office, you have the right to use whatever pronoun you want. Yeah, I really do. Like, I just, I, I think that you have the right to meet people where they are and work that out as you as a medical or, or a, you know, a, th a therapeutic, you know, just do what you need to do. For me, I always thought that using preferred pronouns was no big deal. I mean, un until, again, that watershed year 2015. And that's when I started to realize this is gonna be a tool and it's gonna be a dangerous tool. And then in 2017, when the Lat Latin pr French professor, Peter Fleming in Fleming, V-L-E-M-I-N-G, you can look him up, he lost his job in a private high school in Virginia um, he, he willingly would call the student by whatever name and just said, I'm going to avoid pronouns. And that, you know, tarnished the dignity of the students. And so 
you know, he did, he was fired for his job. So I think we need to think about it as Christians. Um, when other Christians are being fired for their jobs, for just trying to politely avoid the use of pronoun use, um, you know, maybe that is a hill to, just, to stand firm on. I would say in my life, I, I um, had used preferred pronouns for years and, and now I just can't do it. I just can't do it. I feel like I need to stand with the Peter Vlemings of the world because I think it's become, it's, um, you know, I feel like we've just kind of moved into the George Orwell, Ayn Rand world right now. And, you know, pretending that things are not the way they seem would not be helpful. Absolutely. We stand for the truth, right? All right, the next question says, how do we make our voices louder than the world's in teaching our children God's design for marriage? Yeah, I don't know that we're ever gonna, you know, the, it's interesting. That's an, that, that's an interesting perspective. And I don't think that we are going to make our voices louder than the world. I, I think that what we need to do is realize that God has put the church in the midst of a angry, shattering world. And so I would say that the question is not how to be louder. We're not gonna, we're not gonna have a shouting match with the world. But, I, but what we do wanna do is be faithful in the midst of our enemies, right? We see that in Psalm 110, we see that in Psalm 23. Um, and so again, I would say a, a very important question is how is the creation mandate central to the gospel and not peripheral to it? This is something that's really dear to my heart because I just finished a book manuscript on this subject. So I have a book that's coming out on this subject in uh, we think October. But so, I've, so it's kind of just where my head is. So if you're like, oh, Rosaria is really repetitive today, it's just because I literally just turned a manuscript in <laughs> and um, I'm a bit, you know, focused on that. But yes, I think that we need faithful warrior, we need faithful warriors. But here's the thing about warriors, warriors need battles and you've got one. But this idea that somehow, you know, and, and I'd say this is especially dangerous in, um, in broad evangelicalism. It's especially dangerous in these big mega churches that just say, and it's just getting bigger and better and better. And look, we just baptized 800 people in the park. I don't know if they're believers, but we've, they're wet. I don't know if they're believers, but I know they're wet. You know, that kind of nonsense, it's gonna be, you're, we're, we're, that's gonna be like a distant memory. We're gonna be, you know, th those will be like the parlor stories of old. Um, I think it's gonna get hard, and I think we need our children to be faithful, and I think we need them to know that there's going to be a price for their faithfulness. And, and I think we're gonna model that in the jobs we lose um, and the humility we face. But you know, what humbles us is not gonna hurt us. What, what puffs us up will. But no, we won't be louder than the world. How do you recommend parents of an adult child that decided that they are gay and no longer have faith in God talk with their child about their chosen lifestyle without sacrificing the relationship? Yeah, well, first of all, I would say talk to your child about everything, not just, you know, I think the world wants you to think that it's always about being gay. And maybe your child wants you to think it's always about being gay, but you know what? There's a lot of other things in life to talk about. So I would say definitely your challenge is to remain connected without being indoctrinated. And I don't know if you've uh, read the book Irreversible Damage by Abigail Schreier. Now it's really interesting, when it comes to transgenderism, every book I'm gonna recommend you read is written by an unbeliever, which says something. And every book that you tell me you're reading that believers are writing, I'm gonna tell you to have a bonfire with. I'm serious, I'm not kidding you. Um, but anyway, Abigail Schreier is a um, secular Jewish Wall Street Journal um, uh, investigative journalist. And she wrote a book about why all of a sudden our teenage girls are telling us they're transgendered men. You know, what is it about, there's a social contagion, it's called rapid onset gender dysphoria. and. Um, 
And so the book, which is occasionally banned, so if you get a copy, keep it, you might need to sell it on the black market for groceries in six months, I don't know. Um, but I'm, not, I'm sort of kidding, I'm not totally kidding. But she actually has a list of recommendations in the back, and they're excellent. They're absolutely excellent. And you would almost sound like if I said these things, people would be like, oh, those, those fundamentalist Christians. But she actually says things like, pull your kid out of public school, and the list goes on from there. So take it from her, take it from somebody who's not a Christian. This is how, this, I'm not kidding, I don't make this stuff up. But she, she has some really good recommendations in the back. But um, always be a soft place to land. Mom, always be that. Always be able to listen. And to the degree that you are able, find a way to agree, even if privately, that there's always been a difference between acceptance and approval. Um, and that doesn't mean that you don't love your daughter or her friends. All right, I think it's really important, sorry, as I'm reading these questions and talking, I think that you make such an important distinction of the acceptance versus the approval and how we can still have these people in our lives and we can still have them in our homes mm -hmm. without condoning and mm -hmm. applauding their behavior. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important distinction that we want to make in this room. Um, kind of switching gears here, the next question says, how do you navigate being a Christian and struggling with strong same-sex attraction? Yeah, okay, so what I would suggest doing is keeping yourself on a nice, short leash, especially when it comes to entertainment. Um, so I, I'm assuming I'm talking to a woman. I kind of, you know, I think men are just a different, they're just, you know, they're different. They're just different, right? Um, but women tend to, our, our affections travel on a path of emotional connection. And so, um, you want to make sure that you aren't living in fantasy land with your um, entertainment and your friendships and your hobbies and your interests, so that would be one. I would say if you are single, make friends with um, families in the church. And if you're in a church where everybody is so segregated you can't do that, come to my church. Okay, I mean, I'm really serious. I think, you know, what, what's really hard, not just for single women who struggle with same-sex attraction, but it's just for single women, it's hard to feel like the promises of God are real for you. And if we are a family of God, we need to live like a family of God. And I think that does mean that covenant families within the church need to look out for our, our brothers and sisters who are single and make sure that there's always, not always, not just, not just a place at the table on Thanksgiving, but always a place at the table. And I don't know if your experience is gonna be like my experience, but you know, I'm very privileged to be married, I have children, I have children who are, some children who are in faith, some children who are not in faith, um, neighbors who love me, but when my single Christian girlfriends aren't around, I'm, I'm lost. You know, so I think what we need to communicate to our single women in the church is, look, the families need you more than you need them. Um, and look out for the older women, too. Be, be mindful of that. But watch your entertainment. And by watch it, I don't mean watch it. I mean, go to somebody like me and say, okay, Rosaria, this is what I'm watching. And then, and then receive me when I tell you, you don't need cable. You don't need Twitter. You'll be fine without it. Um, and then, and this is kind of, uh, it's obvious, but it needs to be said, center your whole life around the means of grace. Your whole life, the means of grace, the word of God, prayer, sacraments, church membership, center your whole life around that. And if it seems extreme, well, so what? You know, we're heading into some pretty extreme times. So those would be my suggestions.
There's several questions here talking about how this is such a taboo topic in the Christian community and how can we make it m more, how can we talk about it more? How can we reach out and love without accepting, mm -hmm. without accepting, approving, without yeah. approving of, of the people in our church community and yeah. in our greater community? How do we show them hospitality and bring them in so that we can extend to them right the right right i'm probably the worst person to answer that question because it seems like people ask me to talk about this all the time so i'm just wondering when do i get to go to somebody's dinner party and we talk about what's in the casserole you know that's it or we talk about the crossword puzzle so if you ever want to invite me over for dinner and promise to never talk about sexuality i will be really happy um uh, but, but having said that, um, in, in the book, The Gospel Comes with a House Key, I talk a little bit about how important it is to actually have time for people who think differently than you do. And um, to, to, to set the time for that, but also manage that time. And so what I talk about in Gospel Comes with a House Key is just kind of the boring Butterfields, right? Every day, every night at the Butterfields, you know, there's dinner and there's a hefty conversation about anything and anything goes. And it's easy, our children are teenagers, our youngest are teenagers, so I'm not, you know, it's different. If you've got little kids, I understand it's different. Um, but anything goes. And then at a certain time in the evening, the kids bring the dishes to the kitchen and uh, they send the Bibles and the Psalters down the row and we, uh, sometimes we sing a psalm and um, we always will open the word and um, Kent will discuss a chapter or a, a section of the Bible and, and then he'll ask for prayer requests and we'll pray. And then we do it again the next day. You know, and my neighbors, know, my neighbors who fundamentally disagree with us on everything for, under the sun, know that they're always welcome and we're always gonna do that. And, and I think what's important then is that it's the word of God that's speaking to your neighbors. You know, this isn't just like, wow, those Butterfields, they've got some pretty funky opinions. Well, we're not pulling them out of the air. Um, and so to just really, but you know, we live in a very frenetic world. People don't make time for each other. And to actually slow it down and to actually make time for people who disagree with you is really, really important. And, um, and the other thing you wanna do is watch that you aren't um, hoping to be one way in your living room and then making yourself look like a full-on hypocrite because you are because of what you say on social media. So probably the best way to have the best witness is to no longer be on social media. Make it a mystery. Yeah, have the neighbors wonder. I wonder what Rosaria thinks about that. I mean, really, do you think I need any kind of medium that allows me to offend, you know, thousands of people in 140 characters? Probably not. You just heard a pretty calm lecture of mine, you know? I, I don't think so. I mean, so there, there are things, the problem with social media is it, it, it confuses the private and the public and it makes it seem as though the best way to go about your business is to be shouting at people all the time. And that's just not Christian and it's not true. But there are so many times that Christians, that, I mean, sorry, that your unbelieving neighbors won't trust you because of something you said on social media, not something you said when you were digging up irises together to, to give away at the farmer's market. So be mindful of that. Be done with it. It's stupid. It's a stupid waste of time and it makes people idiots. And the, the biggest, the dumbest thing, I mean, if you want to use it for things like prayer meeting has been, you know, changed from 7.30 to 7 because the farmer's market is still using the, you know, the parking lot, that's fine. But the, if you want, really want to be like the biggest idiot of the world, start to argue theology on Twitter. It's terrible. It's, we, and you know what? It, it is a shame. It, 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 it's a scandal is what it is. And it, it denies the holiness of God and it denies him glory. Well, so. tell us how you really feel. <laughs> I don't have strong feelings about anything. <laughs> and I have read your, the book, The Gospel Comes with a House Key, and I just, I love the idea of having an open home and your neighbors, 
need to be welcome. You need to go out to them and have regular meetings where you can come and discuss not just as an echo chamber with people who right. believe exactly right. what you believe, because those meetings make you feel really good, but they don't advance right. the gospel right. in the way that we're called to in the Bible. Right, right. And I would add one more thing to that, though. You're advancing the gospel, and that's great. Now, what church are you inviting people to? Is your church strong, or has, ha has it waffled? You know, a lot, I know a lot of people who are in very weak churches right now, and they're there because they like the golf team, and they like the, you know, I'm serious, and I'm really serious. Like, it's all like about, it's all about that kind of stuff. You need to hold your church up to the word of God. And if, you've, if there are some real issues, maybe you are strong enough to be okay with it, but a baby Christian in your neighborhood isn't, I can guarantee you. So think about where you're worshiping, why you're worshiping there, and could you bring a baby Christian into that? And if, if you can't, should you be there? Mm. I mean, I know a lot of really amazing one-generation churches you know, one generation. They've got a strong generation of women my age, men and women our age, but the, 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 the travesty of apostasy is so powerful that it will never sustain itself to the next generation. So look at your situation. Because COVID has not been good for many churches. We're trading our, our comfort for our conviction, mm -hmm. and we don't want to offend anyone or mm -hmm. close the doors to anyone mm -hmm. instead of holding strong to scripture. I want to ask you this. This is not on the question. So I'm Canadian. I'm from Montreal. And they have oh, just passed yes. new legislation about the fact that the um, name is escaping me right now, but the con anti conversion therapy. Conversion therapy. Yeah. Yes, excuse me. And so if you're unaware, it's a legislation that has made it illegal to speak to counsel anyone who comes to you and says that either for either direction of being gay or being transgender you cannot counsel them pastors are not allowed even if they come to you you're not allowed to speak to them mm -hmm. how do you think that is going to pro propose problems to churches in yeah. Canada and here in the yeah, States yeah yeah oh, no no yeah right and anything that happens in Canada we're always about 4 years behind so um, so yeah no no that's really serious well first of all Conversion therapy used to refer to a form of therapy where someone would come in and say, I'm gay and I wanna be straight, and that person would be involved in a therapeutic process that would supposedly make that transformation. And now, that's not, that would not be a common thing. I, my church is a reformed and confessional church. I come from a church where pastors uh, believe that they are competent to counsel because they are um, and we also would say that the biggest sin in a person's life would not be homosexuality it would be unbelief and so the idea that you would take someone who may or may not be a Christian and just say okay you know we're going to just kind of regroup you uh, uh, for how why, you know, why even? Like, if there's no God who, who's given glory by the temple of my body, why am I doing this? What's, what is this? So it's interesting the way that conversion therapy, which was really dubious at best as a therapy, is now becoming a synonymous with the gospel itself. That's absurd. You know, here's the gospel. The gospel is you were born in sin. One aspect of that sin might be unchosen same-sex attraction. If that is your case, you still have the responsibility to fight that sin, just like my homeschool mom friends who have anger as an indwelling sin have the responsibility of doing that, right? So you're not to practice anything that God calls sin, even if you never remember not be, you know, experiencing it. How do you know it's a sin? The Bible alone. You can't look to your feelings. They don't challenge that. What happens when you become a, a Christian? Well, when, when God justifies you and the Holy Spirit convicts you and, and you, you claim the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ 
paying the penalty of your sin, you have the power to fight that sin. It doesn't say you have the power to no longer sin that way. Okay, a Christian isn't somebody who like goes to, you know, food lion and picks their sin. You don't pick it. That's the whole point. It feels like it picked you, which is why it doesn't feel very fair. So you have the power to fight your sin. And over time, you may be fighting your sin sufficiently that it, it seems to disappear. And over time, you may be fighting your sin sufficiently to the glory of God and it stays just stuck right where it is. And so you have to schedule a daily battle where you drive fresh nails into it every hour. That's what victory means. Victory doesn't necessarily mean you, be, you no longer experience that sin. We pray that it would, but that doesn't always, that's not always the case. And so, um, so this particular legislation basically says that the dignity of an LGBTQ person, put all that in scare quotes, is dependent on never hearing the gospel. So, it's a sobering question. Are you gonna lose your job for that? Well, you, you better be willing to lose your job. Like, you know, seriously, like, I, I mean, here's the thing. The Christian world is going to become smaller and filled with integrity. That's what's gonna happen. You know, if, now, we love our religious liberty. We would like it to continue. I am under the belief that 2015 struck a death blow to it. It's still alive. We'll take it as long as we take it. But if we believe that we can only proclaim the gospel because of religious liberty, we're heretics. The gospel has been proclaimed through every possible political manifestation. And it does pretty well during persecution. So um, if that comes to us, when that comes to us, you will see that the church will become smaller and filled with integrity. And a lot of people will lose their jobs. Separating the wheat from the chaff, right? And we'll see who the true believers are who stand firm in the gospel. Here's a question from a homeschooling mom of six girls and one boy. She asks, as we approach ages where we need to have the talk, what are ways and resources that you can recommend to teach biblical sexuality? Oh man, I wish, you know, I'm gonna have to get, I do, there's a series that someone just sent me that looked really good even for younger ages, but it's not on the top of my head, so I will have to get it to you, um, sure. we'll uh, absolutely. It yeah, but, um, but I also think it's always a good idea to, um, you know, you and your husband should ask your pastor, ask your elders, um, because along with, with, with um, body integrity, which is I think really what we're talking about when we're talking about little people, there's also um, really predator awareness that, that unfortunately our children need to have too. But I do, I have a stack of books, they're on my desk and they're not in my brain right now. So, but I will get them back to you. Okay. And I've heard, it doesn't have to be the talk. We have this pressure of like this one time oh, sit no, no. down conversation. No, no. It needs to be many like talks. Saying, talk about yeah. with your kids. You need to be the safe place where they can come yeah. and speak with you about yeah. all matter of subjects. Yeah. All right. We have time for maybe one more. All right. Could you discuss more? And I know it's on your note sheet about intersectionality. Yes. In a couple sentences, could you review what that is and what that means for us in our world and especially in the church? Yes, 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 absolutely. So intersectionality is a form of critical theory that was popular in um, social science departments in the 1990s. That was you know, pretty much when I was in graduate school and then in the professoriate. It moved into English departments in the late 1990s. Um, it basically says that who you are is determined by how many victim intersections you can find. And depending upon how many intersections you have, that determines how much legitimacy you have to speak. So a deaf, incarcerated, transgender person who is also poor has four more intersections than my husband over there. 
And that means that person has more license to speak in the world. Now, before COVID, I, don't, I only speak like this these days because I discovered that I can do a lot from my office and it, at home, and it's better on my family if I don't travel. So I only travel like an hour from home. So you guys are it. You guys are my outer edge. Um, um, but before COVID, when I was traveling a lot, I, p- parents were starting to talk to me about the strange phenomenon happening at um, uh, state colleges, uh, especially sociology classes their white male sons were told to sit in the back of the big auditorium with bandanas on their mouth to prove that they were allies, while everyone else was allowed, you know, any, where people with the greatest amount of intersections were allowed to talk. I thought that sounded crazy. So, you know, I asked friends of mine who still work at public institutions if that's true, and they told me, of course it's true. Of course, how else will we teach people the importance of intersectionality. So from the Christian perspective, the, the, there are two problems, well, three problems that, the, with intersectionality in the church, because this is a big deal. Like you're just like, okay, leave it at Ohio State. Why is it in my church? Why, why did the pastoral, um, why is the, the, um, the committee to hire so-and-so why are we having to ask how many intersections that person has? Whatever happened to meritocracy? Um, is intersectionality the, really, does the book of James say the best way to deal with um, sectarianism and false um, egregious forms of preference is, is by denying meritocracy? Well, no, not at all. But there are a couple of problems. So one is, Intersectionality fosters an unbiblical view of human identity, a little bit like LGBTQ. Um, Elizabeth Corey, one of the people who studies this, says intersectional theorists begin their work on the basis of a debatable, though never debated, set of characteristics that supposedly constitute human identity, race, gender, class, sexual orientation, ethnicity, weight, attractiveness, age, and the list goes on becoming more complex and more dire with each new addition. Intersectionality does not have a biblical category of sin. So it fails to distinguish between social descriptions of people that are morally neutral, such as race and gender, with those that are morally charged, such as sexual orientation and gender identity. It lumps them all together. So the same church that really wants to deal with race by making sure that they have an African-American pastor. If they're using intersectionality to make that choice, they're also going to have a revoice conference and a support group for sexual minorities because they can't make a distinction, a moral distinction between any of these categories. Does that make sense? So that's number one. Number two, intersectionality fosters emotional maturity and lack of perseverance. Have you ever wondered why it seems like our churches have been taken over by kindergartners and all we do is add more kindergartners? And so far, the, neither the reading level nor the potty you know, success rate has gone up. Okay, it's because of the emotional immaturity that the church is, is calling grace. When you hear the church, oh, just give us more grace. Well, if you want more grace, then you want more blood of Christ, which means you want more ransom for sin, which means you want more repentance. Um, so intersectionality fosters emotional immaturity. It quickly escalates from a system of analysis to a deeply held belief that who you truly are is measured by how many victim statuses you can claim with human dignity only accruing through intolerance of disagreement of any kind. The community that is produced by intersectionality is fractured, victim-minded, angry, and inconsolable. They, can't, they come across like toddlers in need of a snack and a nap. And you really saw this on college campuses after the 2016 election of Donald Trump when students were encouraged, I am not kidding you, these would be grown-ups to bring their teddy bears, their blankies, their colored pencils, and their coloring books to have a cry fest. Now, for those of us who were college students in a different era, it, you, just, like, you just wonder what planet you're on. And finally, 
within the church, intersectionality fosters social division and not unity. When intersectionality enters the church, and it's entered every megachurch I've ever seen, uh, it puffs up false teachers who send weak-minded souls searching for identity in the wrong places. Gospel identity and gospel citizenship is not found in the fickle heart of man's deep hurts. Gospel identity and gospel citizenship is found in God alone. So it's bad news and it's everywhere. And if it's in your church, you need to look around. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for submitting your questions. Thank you so thank much, you. Rosaria. Thank you. Okay, I will just pray and we will close out our morning. Bow with me. Father, we thank you so much for this time, Lord, that has been set apart to study your word and um, to grow together as a church body. We thank you for all of the ladies who came and gave of their time and um, to study this very important topic. And Father, I pray that you would stir our hearts to find our identity in you alone. I pray, Lord, that we would be energized to not only read our Bibles, but study the word so that we could be equipped to go out to our neighbors and bring them into our homes and and share the truth of who you are and who you've called us to be. I thank you, Lord, for um, Rosaria's talk and just the life-giving nature of it. I thank you for um, her study and her preparation. And just pray, Lord, that, um, that we would not just be um, hearers of your word, but that we would be doers. I pray that this would um, light a fire in us so that we could serve our communities and love our families and ultimately honor you with our words and our, our thoughts and our actions. I pray, Father, that we would come boldly before the throne of grace, repentance, humility, so we could put on the, the robes of righteousness that is so freely offered to us through the blood of Christ. I thank you for this morning, for all the volunteers who gave of their time and their talents to make this morning a success. And, and God, I just pray that as we go back out into the world, we would... Um, to hold beacons of hope to a lost and dying world. And at the end of the day, Lord, that we would be bold, that we would be brave for you, and we would be sacrificially willing to give up everything for the sake of the gospel. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.